with an exciting topic, let's start with Kubernetes. The slide deck that I'm going to use will definitely be available for you, okay? Uh, I don't need to introduce myself, you know me already. So let's ask the, uh, the important question, what is Kubernetes? Imagine the following situation. You meet a student from a lower class and they ask you, we have heard about Kubernetes, we have no idea what that is. What is Kubernetes? What would you answer? And that's the point. You can distribute the workload over a server cluster. That's the idea. You don't have a single server anymore, but you can add two or three or 10 or 20 or 100 or thousands or ten tens of thousands of computers to a single Kubernetes cluster. And the scalability comes from the fact that Kubernetes will distribute your load across all these computers. And you can take a large hammer, walk into your data center and destroy some of your servers and Kubernetes will automatically redistribute the load over the servers that remain. So if you, for instance, have to pull out the server and replace it because it's dead, that's absolutely no problem. Kubernetes will handle that. If you add additional servers at runtime to your cluster, absolutely no problem. Kubernetes will manage that. So the whole idea of Kubernetes is managing containers in a cluster. That is what's important. Yes? So does Kubernetes um, manage it to, so every server has about the same percentage of CPU load or how is... It? Oh, it's way more complicated. It's way more complicated. It's not, it's not naive in distributing the load. You have multiple nodes in a Kubernetes cluster and you can assign, let's say, various properties to these nodes. You can add so-called tags to the nodes. A tag could be, this node has a specifically strong GPU, a graphical processing unit. And when you schedule pods, pods is the name for containers in Kubernetes, you can define some restrictions on which node this pod should run. And if you know that your pod needs GPU support, you can say, run it on any computer that fulfills these and that uh, properties. Understand what I mean? Yeah. So the, the scheduling is really sophisticated. And the, I think the, the idea is simple things should be simple, but complex things should be possible. So it, it takes a lifetime to master Kubernetes, but the simple things that we will focus on are not very complicated. So it's not just distribute everything equally. It's way more complicated. Okay, good. I have some slides here. Um, yes, it's a platform for containerized workloads. It was uh, created by Google and they open sourced it in 2014. And I think it's safe to say Kubernetes has taken over the cloud. Kubernetes is the widest used cloud operating system on this planet. It's used by Google, by Microsoft, by everybody. Sometimes, if you, for instance, go into the, into the Azure cloud, you don't even see that Microsoft is using Kubernetes behind the scenes. So sometimes you use Kubernetes without even seeing it. But here in school, I mean, we are programmers, we are DevOps specialists, or we are becoming DevOps specialists, so we try to use Kubernetes directly. Good, first one. It's a portable cloud platform. What does that mean? Kubernetes is not bound to the Google Cloud. Kubernetes can be installed on-premise, on your local computer, in the Google Cloud, in the AWS Cloud, in the Microsoft Cloud, in any cloud on this planet. And the, the nice thing is, if you master Kubernetes, you are not bound to a single cloud provider. You can run your applications everywhere. That's the most important advantage. There is a disadvantage too. Kubernetes is not trivially simple. Kubernetes isn't that super complicated, but it requires a certain amount of basic skills. If you want to have it as simple as possible, it's typically easier to focus on a single cloud, let's say the Microsoft Azure cloud or the Google cloud, and use the native functionality built into that cloud. Then you will not see Kubernetes. Maybe it works in the background, maybe not, but it's easier, it's easier to use. So for your diploma thesis, for your diploma button, you really have to think hard whether you want to use Kubernetes directly 
or whether you want to have a more abstract layer that is easier to use. It is a very nice exercise to use Kubernetes directly. But for instance, in my company, my professional company, we don't use a single Kubernetes server. Why? It would be too complicated. We don't have the time. We don't get paid the money from our customers to do that. We just want to fulfill their feature requests. And for that, we go 100% directly into the native features of Azure. Microsoft is using Kubernetes in the background. I don't care. It's too complicated for my everyday job. Understood? That is only possible because in my company we focus on a single cloud. But think of, think of a large company like Dynatrace that, is only, that also has a strong presence here in Linz. They are building software for a multitude of customers and some of them are allowed to go in the cloud, some of them use Google, some of them use AWS, some of them use whatever. For a company like that, Kubernetes is super important because they can develop for Kubernetes and then they can run their software on any cloud. Got it? That is meant with portable cloud platform. It reduces your lock-in effect to a certain cloud provider. Good. Next one. A very important concept of Kubernetes is that you have this current state and a desired state. What does that mean? You could, for instance, say, I have this nice little backend API and dear Kubernetes, please run four instances of this API. If one dies, I have three left. The current state is the number of containers that are currently running and are currently healthy. The desired state is the state that you tell Kubernetes to, to get in. Typically, desired state and current state are equal, are the same. I want to have four instances, I have four instances. Kubernetes, you can chill. You don't need to do anything. But if a server dies, for instance, suddenly I don't have four instances anymore. I only have three because a server died. And then Kubernetes will kick in, recognize that the current state, three instances, does not match the desired state, four instances, and it will do what? It will start a new one. You can also change the configuration. You can say, previously the desired state was four instances. Now it's in the middle of the night, Nobody cares about my application, so we can scale down. And you change the configuration and you say, the current state is four, but now I change the desired state to one. What will Kubernetes do? It will shut down three instances, so one will remain. And that is one of the most important things that Kubernetes is to do. You give it a configuration, and it always validates whether the current state fulfills that configuration. If you change the configuration, it will change the the layout of your containers. Understood? Yeah, it's a little bit simplified, but that's essentially the thinking that has to go it through your head. It's container-centric. Yeah? We, we all already know that, and we, we, we focus on Docker images. But you already know now that Kubernetes is not solely connected to Docker. Kubernetes is independent of Docker. It is built on the standard Linux containers, okay? not on Docker. Docker is a, is a commercial product, or an open source product. What does a Kubernetes cluster consist of? First, you always have a master. You have a master server. And this master server runs the API server. You will see in the demos in a few minutes that technically, Kubernetes is just an API. Just like the APIs that you built. It's a REST API. Do you want to start a new container? Spin up an application? Technically, you send an HTTP POST request to this API, and then it spins up the application. Do you want to stop a container? You send an HTTP DELETE statement, uh, sorry, request to Kubernetes, and it will stop the machine, stop the container, to be technically exact. And this API server runs on the master. It's also called control plane, because you can control the whole API. Secondly, it runs etcd, etcd. It's frequently pronounced etcd. etcd is a distributed database. It's the database system where Kubernetes stores all its data. So Kubernetes is not using MySQL or Postgres or, or something like that. It, use, it uses etcd. etcd is, is very simple. 
but it's super sophisticated when it comes to um, secure when it comes to uh, high availability and performance. It's super fast, and you cannot kill this beast because it's so strong in replicating the data over a cluster, so that if some cluster nodes die, it will never go away. Okay, that's the idea of AdSD. You can definitely take a look at AdSD and, and use it in your own projects if you want, but Kubernetes makes heavy use of that. By the way, every, everything of them is a link. Let me quickly show them, show that to you. I will click on this link. It will open the browser and you will get directly into the GitHub repository or directly in the, to, into the documentation. Like for instance here with the RP server, you, will see, you can read more if you are interested in details. Scheduler. The scheduler is there for really performing the tasks to run containers. So the scheduler uh, receives some requests and say, hey, schedule a container this or there, and it will find the correct node and it will run it. Yeah, and finally, you have a lot of other um, things that are not that important for us. Beside the master, you have nodes. Every Kubernetes cluster has at least, no, not at least, Every Kubernetes cluster has, to put it simple, one master and then one to n nodes. In a very simple setup, the master and the single node can run on the same computer. That's Docker desktop, for instance. But in a more professional setup, like here in our school, you have a master and multiple nodes. We have here technically in, in the school three servers for this Kubernetes cluster, three pretty strong servers. So they can handle a lot of load. In the cloud, if you create a cluster in, in Azure, you can simply take a slider and say, give me a Kubernetes cluster with a master and 1,000 nodes. You click on save, you wait for 15 minutes, and you have 1,000 nodes. And you can start working. It's not, exp it, it's not cheap, but yeah, if you need it, you have. On every node, you have multiple services running. I will not go into all the details, but there is one, um, one important thing here, which is called a kubelet. And this kubelet is a service that ensures, like it is written here, that the pods, what a pod is, you will heard it in a, min in, in a minute, that the pods are healthy and running. That's a kubelet. So the kubelet is responsible, responsible for starting the containers, for monitoring the containers and for shutting the containers down on a single cluster node. Every cluster node runs kubelets. There is also the notion of so-called virtual kubelets. Virtual kubelets are kubelets which do not exist physically on a, sing a single node. A virtual kubelet, for instance, in Microsoft Azure, if you run a container on a virtual kubelet, it will dynamically, on the fly, allocate a new server, or it is able to do that, schedule the container there, and when you delete the container, it will deprovision the server automatically. So it makes your Kubernetes cluster grow. It makes it breathe, okay? The next one is also important, it's the network proxy. The network proxy means that you have a virtual network spanning across the entire cluster. So if you run a Kubernetes, uh, if you run a container on cluster node one, and another container on cluster node two, the network proxy makes sure that these containers can talk to each other, although they run on different clusters. Okay? Yeah, the rest is not that important. Good. Yes, this is the web API. The web API is also documented. You can take a look at the documentation. But now comes the important thing. Listen, this is important, okay? Uh, I will tell you when it's really crucial that you try to focus. This one is important. There is a CLI tool, command line interface, which is called kubectl. I pronounce it kubectl because I, I like how this sounds. Um, kubectl is a very small client. It's essentially only the possibility for you to call the web API without having to use a tool like Postman. It's really very thin. All it does is what it gives you, what you give it through the command line, it's put into an HTTP request and sent to Kubernetes. That's all kubectl does. All we can do with kubectl, we can do with Postman too, and I will show you that. It's just a very thin wrapper on top of a web API. 
The most important job for kubectl is authentication. Because every request to Kubernetes needs an access token. And kubectl uh, frees you from the burden to get the bearer token by hand. You can get the bearer token by hand, I will show you that. And you can build your own kubectl, but it's very convenient. You will see that in a second. Yeah. So, let's get started. Let's get started with the first exercises. If you want, and if you have um, the, if you have followed the guidelines from the HTL Leonding Cloud, then you can follow along. Otherwise, you can watch, make notes, and later on, once you have it installed, you can rewatch the video. Of course, I'm recording that, and take a look at. Um, at what, what we did in this exercise. Let me quickly see if the recording is running. Yes, the recording is running, so I can give you the, the exercise later on. Good. Let me start my Windows terminal. Here is my Windows terminal. I will use the, the Linux environment. And let me quickly show you what you need for our school, for our school's Kubernetes cluster. If you work for your diploma thesis not in our school but you want to run it in azure or if you want to run it in the in, in docker desktop you have to consult the documentation there so the next few minutes will only be for our school again if you don't want to use the kubernetes cluster of our school check the documentation of the proper cloud google cloud aws amazon whatever for our cloud for our school cloud Oh, sorry, that is the wrong browser. That is the correct browser. So, this is the correct browser. Yes. You can go to cloud.hdlleonding.ac.at and then you can try to log in. And hopefully, you will, you will succeed in logging in. So, if you don't have an account yet, it is a good idea to maybe, beside uh, watching me, creating an account. It only takes a minute or so. Okay? This is that one. And then you can scroll down a little bit and go to the documentation. The documentation of our school's cloud. And there you find a description what you need. You need to install two tools. You need to install kubectl and you need to install kube login. Our school's Kubernetes cluster use an open ID connect. Can you remember? Azure Active Directory. It does not use Azure Active Directory, but it uses the same protocol that we have learned in this course. So it's a good repetition of open ID connect. It's not trivial to set that up because you have to install multiple tools, but you can follow it along. Okay, so these are the two tools that you need. I, for my part, I have already installed kubectl. So if I run it, I get it here. And now let's make a few exercises. If you don't have access, if you didn't install the tools prior to this course, it's more important for me if you watch and if you try to understand the concepts. You can try it at home. This is a preparation for your diploma thesis. So I want to give you the conceptual knowledge to then try it at home and finish the setup and whatever you want to do. So, I have thought of a bunch of exercises, yeah. And I will check that. Kubectl, get what did I want to do first? Yeah, secret. If you signed in, oh, see, I have to sign in because I didn't, obviously it my, my sign in expired. Let me quickly sign in here. Yeah, now it looks good. If you type kubectl get secret, it will show you a list of all the secrets that are currently stored for you. Now, if we take the first one, this one here, and we say kubectl get secret this one, we will see the details of this thing. We could even say kubectl, not get secret, but we could say kubectl describe secret and it will definitely put um, a blur effect over this token once uh, the video goes online because this token is the magic token which represents your user 
This is the bearer token that kubectl sends to your Kubernetes cluster in order to prove that you are the person that you are claiming to be. Can anybody remember what the name of the token format is that we see here? Again, it's OpenID Connect, the same as we had in Azure Active Directory. This is a <laughs> token. The abbreviation is JWT. Yes? Exactly. That's a JSON web token, correctly. So I could copy this token and put it into jot.io, and then you can take a look at the token and it will see all the details. This is a JOT token, okay? So technically, kubectl will control your browser, will redirect you to the login page of our school's Kubernetes cluster, then you sign in, and behind the scenes, it will fetch the secret from the Kubernetes cluster, and whenever you interact with Kubernetes, it will send this token to the Kubernetes cluster to prove that you are the one you claim to be. Got it? It's digitally signed and yeah, it works with all Kubernetes clusters like that. If you take a look at Azure or your local Docker desktop cluster, it works similarly. The process of getting this token is always a little bit different, but for our school it's OpenID Connect. That was the first demo. Now I would like to prove you that this really works. So let's run Visual Studio Code. <laughs> and I want to introduce you to a rather new extension which I started to really like. It's called Thunder. The Thunder Client. See that one? Thunder Client. If you like Postman, you will love the Thunder Client. The Thunder Client is essentially Postman built into Visual Studio Code for free. So Thunder Client is really, really nice. And whenever we want to interactively play with an API, we could use the Thunder Client instead of Postman. Postman is great, don't get me wrong, but having it built into Visual Studio Code is really useful. So that's a little bit of a sidestep, but an important one. Now let's try to access our Kubernetes cluster only through the HTTP protocol. Forget kubectl. Now we will do it really in the command line. No, in the, in the Thunder Client. If you want to do that, you need to know the public IP address of our Kubernetes cluster. And I looked it up. The public IP address of our school's Kubernetes cluster is that one. If you're working with a Kubernetes cluster in Azure, for instance, that would be the public, um, fully qualified domain name of your Kubernetes cluster in Azure. If you have it in Google, then this would be the domain name of your Kubernetes cluster in Google. But our school's Kubernetes cluster runs on 192.88.23.5, and the port for the API is 6443. It's noted in the documentation. Then we say API v1 namespaces, and then we have to specify a so-called namespace. What is a namespace? If multiple users use the same Kubernetes cluster, and all of them would create a, an application which is called demo, we would have a big problem. Because one user's demo app would overwrite the other user's demo app. Understood? Therefore, we separate the Kubernetes cluster into multiple namespaces. Every student in our school gets his or her own namespace. When you register with the HTL Leoning Cloud, you get your own namespace. If you run your own Kubernetes cluster in Azure, in Google Cloud, or locally, you will always work in the default namespace, typically, if it's your own cluster. Then you are administrator and you can do whatever you want. But this is another important concept that you have to understand. If you share a Kubernetes cluster with many other people, the concept which separates the Kubernetes cluster into distinct elements for each developer is the namespace. So the namespace concept for our school's Kubernetes cluster is student dash, and in my case it's r.stropec, and that is turned into r-stropec. So your namespace would be student dash 
first letter of your first name dash last name. And at the end we say pause. Okay, if I try to send that one, I will get a forbidden. See that one? Doesn't work. But we can also we can already reach our, our Kubernetes cluster. We are already talking to our Kubernetes cluster. Isn't that great? It's just a REST API. Now let's add the token. I told you before that technically the whole authentication stuff results in this access token here. I can copy it, I can paste it here, and I can send it again. And guess what? Success. This is a list of pods, a list of containers running in my namespace on our school's Kubernetes cluster. The important information here that you have to understand is that Kubernetes is only a web API. It's a RESTful web API. And kubectl only makes this process easier. Because with kubectl, we can say kubectl get pods. Enter. And we get a little list of pods. This get here is the HTTP verb here. We don't have to specify the name of the server because my kubectl is already connected to the server. And we say we want to have pods. You see, we want to have, where is it? Here we want to have pods. And also with kubectl, we do not have to specify a token because it's fetched the token automatically. But technically, it's just an HTTP request. Got it? So now you know why we as teachers are so, so much insisting on you learning what REST APIs are, what HTTP is, how that works. Because if you don't understand those basic protocols, you cannot work with a system like Kubernetes and it's absolutely necessary to be able to do that. Okay, nice. So first demo, check. Now we can do a trick. Let me show you a trick. I can run kubectl in proxy mode. Oh, it's already running somewhere, probably here. Okay, you see, I run kubectl in proxy mode. What does proxy mode mean? Proxy mode means that I now have a local host port. You see that one? And every request that I send to the local host port is forwarded to the Kubernetes cluster. But during the forwarding, kubectl will automatically add the token. So we can now do the following thing. We can go back to the Thunder client and we can replace the public IP address to a local host IP address, as you can see it here and enter this port 8001. You see that one? And now we can remove the bearer token. And when I am lucky, yes, it still works. So kubectl proxy gives us a proxy in the middle, which injects authentication into every request to Kubernetes. So now we can talk to Kubernetes on localhost, although Kubernetes is not running on localhost. It's running somewhere in the Azure cloud, somewhere in the Google cloud, in our case, somewhere in the basement. But still, the proxy will do the heavy lifting of adding the token and redirecting the requests to our cluster. Do you understand what I mean with token, uh, with proxy? Yes? This is important. This kubectl proxy is really, really important. So if I want to draw that one, let me quickly draw that here, just to make sure that everybody understands that. Here in the background here, we have our Kubernetes cluster. Kubernetes is often abbreviated with K8S because Ubernetes, no, sorry, Ubernete is eight, digit, uh, eight letters. And in the front you have a K and at the end you have an S. This is why you call it K8S. K then eight letters, I'm too, um, too lazy to type and then an S. So you often find K8S as a, as a commonly used abbreviation. Then here on my local computer, I have my, just as I told you, showed you that, my Thunder client or any other REST client that you have. And then on my local computer, 
I run kubectl. My Thunder client accesses kubectl, the kubectl proxy. Let's write proxy here. kubectl proxy, and this one runs on 127.0.0.1. And then the kubectl proxy will send the request to the Kubernetes cluster, including access token. And then everything is good. This is the kubectl proxy mode. And you will very, very frequently use that. Understood? Good. Nice. Did you, did you like the Thunder client? Isn't it great? It works really, really nice. So this might be also very useful for your diploma thesis. If you build an API, the Thunder client can help you a lot. Read the documentation. It is capable of doing really crazy stuff. Now let's use that. Let's use the Thunder client to start an application. Okay? Let's do that. In this case, I would like to really run a new container. And if I want to create something, we have learned that in this course, we will use which HTTP verb? Not get, not patch, not put, not delete, but post, correct. So what we do, we go to the Thunder client and switch get to post. We don't need a bearer token because we go through the proxy. Then we go to the body and here we can specify what we want to do in the form of JSON. You have that in my slides. Uh, for those, th does anybody follow along now live? Yes, you do? You need, to, you need to have those slides, right? Because you don't want to copy that or type that. Let me show you where you can find that. Um, I will send it in the Discord server in a second. The slide deck is here. You can download it from here. Give me a sec. Oh, I stopped the Kubernetes custom. Uh, the, the wrong one, I stopped the Discord. I need to start Discord again to the slides, okay? So if you want to follow along live, download the slides and go to page to slide number eight. Slide number eight. Good. So what I did, I copied the JSON con... Not yet. Yeah, now. I copied the JSON content into our HTTP request. And the thing that we are starting here is a pod. Now let me quickly tell you what a pod is. A pod is like a container. Typically, a pod contains a single container. But technically, a pod could contain multiple containers. Imagine a web application that needs some caching. And for caching purposes, you have a so-called sidecar. Do you know what a sidecar motorcycle is? And a Beiwagen machine, you know what that is? It's like, like that, you have a main machine and for certain purposes, you need a sidecar. For instance, a Redis cache or a very small database or whatever. In such cases, you would take two containers and put them in a pod together. But in general, for simple scenarios, a pod is a container, okay? And if you take a look, if I scroll down, I'm just using the Nginx Alpine base image here. So I'm just starting an empty web server. Remember what we did before. The rest of the JSON, it's really not important. We'll talk about that later on. Currently just accept that it is like it is. Now, if I run this guy, I get back, see that one? 201 created. But we didn't create a record in a database but we really started a new pod, a new container on our Kubernetes cluster. So with the REST API, we can control the Kubernetes cluster. Give me a second. If I go to my machine here, maybe start a second Ubuntu shell and say kubectl get pods, we will then see that I have now, see, my demo pod running for 30 seconds. Understood? 
This is what we now managed. So we now have a container running. That's awesome. Just with a post request. Question. Um, I cannot yeah, send the post request because it says it's forbidden, but I um, set up the proxy and I can also log into my dashboard. Yes. Did you really correctly enter the namespace? <laughs> That is important. Check that one, please. Is the namespace correct? If it is, we'll check it. It's not mine. You have to change that one. Okay, I wrote students. Ah, yeah. And, and then you don't have the permission to write into this namespace. Try to fix that. Does it work now? Yeah, it works. Awesome. Very good. Very good. So you were able to run this pod. The question is, we have, I think, five minutes left in this lesson. That's perfect. How can we check that out? How can we make sure that really works? Absolutely no problem. If we take a look at the next slide here, what we can do is we can, let me see if I have that here. Yes. We can do a port forwarding, it's down here. You'll, I will show it to you in a second. See, I do that one. You see that one? I will do a port forward of our demo pod, port 80. So, if I run this guy, I will see that it is now forwarded on port 35949. So what I can now do, please listen closely, this is important. I have my kubectl proxy running locally. And what now the kubectl proxy does, it, it mounted the port 80 from my pod through the kubectl proxy on my local machine on port 35949. So now I can access this one. I can access my application. Let's go into the browser here on 127.0.0.1 and run it and I get back, woohoo, an Nginx web server. And this is, now you have to use your imagination. This doesn't need to be a static web server. This can be your API. This can be your .NET API, your Java API. This can be your dynamic web application, whatever. Okay? So it's very simple to simply try it. And the important step here is the port forwarding that allows us to peek into our Kubernetes cluster. Again, this would work exactly the same in the Azure cloud, exactly the same in the Google cloud, exactly the same locally on your Docker desktop. That's the beauty of Kubernetes. It's independent of the cloud where it runs. Nice. Last but not least, we have to delete our pod to free everything. So, let's go into the Thunder client and change the post request to a delete request. But now, we have to add at the end, not just pods, but we have to specify the name of the pod. And I think I called it API demo pod, because in practice, this would be an API. So, let's add API demo pod. You see the delete here? We can remove the body and we can run it. And we get status 200 OK. And if I'm fast enough and I say kubectl get pods, maybe I'm fast enough. No, I wasn't fast enough. For a short amount of time, the status would have been changed from running to terminating. But it was too slow. The pod was killed so fast that I never saw it again. It's gone. Understood? HTTP get for reading data, HTTP post for creating parts, HTTP delete for deleting parts, HTTP patch if we would like to change um, the, some configuration values. I will do, you don't need to follow along here, I will do the post again, here, the post again, and this time I will use our rstropback slash Hello, Nginx. Can you remember? We did that in the morning. This is our Docker image that we created together 
that compiled the TypeScript into JavaScript and then I published it on the Docker Hub. And here you now see how these puzzle pieces fit together. I can run this one. Uh, I have to fix that one. I don't need the API demo part here. Let's run this one. Finger crossed. 201 created. Let's check. Container creating, see? Now I was fast enough. Running. Now let's do the port forwarding again. This time I got the port 32911. Let's go into the browser, change the port here, and fingers crossed, see? Hello Docker, hello world. So now we have brought together the exercise in the morning where we built the Docker file, where we built the Docker file into an image, and we took the image and put it on the Docker hub. And now we have connected to Kubernetes. And even without kubectl, we just used HTTP requests to spin up a Docker, uh, sorry, to spin up a pod in Kubernetes using the image that we created in the morning together with the Docker file. And now things should fit together a little bit in your mind, okay? In your diploma thesis, you would maybe write C sharp code. The Docker file, as I showed you in the morning, will be generated by Visual Studio. Just build the Docker file, push it to the Docker Hub, mention the correct Docker image here, and your diploma thesis runs in the Nehati Leone cloud. Pretty simple. The complicated stuff is authentication. The rest is a piece of cake. Good. We have very good timing because now I think we have a break. But final final question uh, before we go into the break. Do you have time? Pardon? I have a problem with, with the problem. We will check that in the break, okay? So for now, let's do five minutes break and then we will continue.